Hi, everybody, and welcome to NextGenInfra.io. I'm Jim Carroll. I'm editor of Converge Digest. Today, we are taking a look at the future of quantum networking with Dr. Noel Goddard, who is CEO of Kinect. Uh, Kinect is pioneering the hardware stack needed for scalable quantum secure communications over existing fiber. So first off, Noel, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So um, to kick this off, could you give us a little bit of background about Qnet? And, um, you know, I understand that you guys just uh, completed a, a funding round. Yes, yeah, so it's a very exciting time for Qnet. We just announced that uh, we had an oversubscribed Series A extension, um, aiming to, to get at least 10 million into the company. And uh, Cisco Investments participated, which was great news. I think one of the the turning points in the industry right now is that you're seeing a company like Cisco, who basically developed the tools for the digital internet, now putting a stake in the ground saying it's time to pay attention to quantum. Uh, it's time now to start thinking about quantum as not just being a laboratory experiment. That now it's now it's ready. Now it's ready to actually be uh, piloted and to to show off what it can actually do. So Qnext got started like many quantum companies in academia. It's not unusual to be academic spin-outs because these are very science-heavy innovations. We started off by inventing a quantum memory, and you can think of a, a memory as something which introduces timing into any network. So it's very important for a lot of the sophisticated network protocols uh, that are coming uh, to, to bear now. But we realized very shortly into thinking about how we would actually form a company that we needed to back up and to think about the fundamental hardware stack. And as you said in your introduction, Qnect is basically focused on bringing a hardware stack to deployment, which is what we've spent four years doing, uh, basically de-risking six different instruments which now sit in that stack. And what the stack does is it creates the type of currency that you would use for doing quantum protocols over existing fiber. So our stack creates entangled photons preserves them as they're being distributed through the network and then validates them on the endpoints. So you can think of it like the basic pieces that you use now for networking, same thing, right? Except for what we're doing is we're doing it for a system where the currency of the system is now entangled photons rather than photon bursts like we're using right now to do this podcast. I see. So without digging too deep into the physics, could, could you explain a little bit more of the, the, the operating principle behind um, quantum memory? How, how is it that the entangled photons can be preserved, I guess, and uh, replicated perhaps? So there's a, it, does, it always sounds like black magic, I suppose, yeah. is the first part. But I think that most people from just the popular literature know this concept of spooky action as a at a distance. What... Um, What's very special about quantum networking, the way that Qnect does it, is this idea of starting off with a pair of entangled photons. Those are particle, particles of light. When they're created, they basically, at that point, have an identity which is preserved through a physical process, which means that if I keep one and I give one to you and then you look at it, you know what I have and the vice versa is true. If I look at what I have, then I know what you have. That means that there's always this validator because you have the pair of photons and it's why people were very interested in using quantum networking uh, initially for security protocols. But now it can do something deeper. And the idea is if you could actually manage to preserve in this property of entanglement, which is very fragile, so preserving it's tricky. If you could manage to preserve it as you distribute it over a network, then when it gets to the endpoints, you could connect them with entanglement. And that starts to become very powerful when you start think of connecting quantum computers the same way that we connect digital computers today. And the concept of the quantum internet is effectively quantum devices connected by quantum channels. But the channels have to host entangled photons and, and distribute entanglement in order to have those connections be, be valid. The power of that, I mean, we've already heard, I think, for the past you know, five years, what the potential of quantum computing is. And the same was true when digital computers first started coming out. But we all know what type of revolution was on the backside when you started to be able to network those devices and gain the power of networking. And I think the same will be true for quantum. Fascinating. So, so you really are talking about keeping the communications part of it in the quantum domain and not using classical networking to connect to quantum computers. 
Yes. Uh, largely because of that security feature that I mentioned before. When a really great uh, example of something that can be done in quantum that can't be done classically is you could use quantum networking to communicate to your quantum computer in a way that nobody would know what was being sent when it, the quantum computer is processing the job. So it's often referred to as blind computing. And what's special about that is if you're using a computer for something like developing a new drug formulation, developing, you know, a, a new battery formulation, doing a new logistics protocol, worrying about doing dividend calculations, you want all of that to be really secure. So you don't actually want whoever is processing the job to know what's happening and what the answers are. You want it to be so secure that the only, only people who can actually read the information are the ones who are communicating over the quantum channel. So that's a, that's a long forward leaning vision. Right. But I think, you know, what Cisco is really interested in, if you back it up to that idea of just connecting computers, Connect uh, basically has demonstrated at this point metropolitan scale networks in both New York and Berlin. But when you think about what is a data center, a data center is effectively like a network in a building. I mean, sorry, a city's worth of fiber within a building, right? So you just shrink it down. Um, the same tools that we've developed in order to do this on that macro scale and uh, in a sort of metropolitan network can be used to distribute information through a data center. And that's basically one of the core things which we use now as a society for doing heavy compute is where we've now become quite accustomed to the fact that the data center is the model. But to build quantum data centers, you're going to have to figure out the quantum infrastructure piece. So Connect really considers ourselves a infrastructure company, which is analogous to what Cisco did years before. But Cisco's interest in Connect also goes back to this question of infrastructure. If you're going to actually build something which is going to support the data center of the future, you have to start thinking about the infrastructure questions today. Exactly. Uh, Cisco has, um, in the past few months, you know, started discussing this in in various uh, forums, and uh, it's just fascinating to track, you know, this uh, conversation about what are all the elements that are needed to bring switching, routing, all of the store and forward, one to many, all, all of these concepts that um, have existed in classical networking into the quantum domain. It looks like, you know, perhaps this is uh, one of those fundamental um, elements or building blocks that's needed. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about the process of taking this from from the, the lab then, um, the academic uh, idea that, that birthed this to now a startup company with, as you said, these two real world implementations. Every road is long. I suppose that's the, the, real, the real answer when it comes to commercializing hard tech. Uh, but there are a lot of pieces along the way that helped us. I think the first uh, started with the first, first spin out, right? So the spin out of having a technology which had a value proposition specifically for quantum networking, and that was the quantum memory. The quantum memory is very unique in the fact that it operates at room temperature. Most of the time when you see uh, the beautiful chandelier in the pictures of quantum computing press, remember that, that that sits in a freezer that chills things down to colder than outer space, right? So quantum works very well in the cold, and that's because everything is still, so you have no uh, extra, piece of ever, extra um, noise which is coming into the system. It's hard when you start to raise the temperature up to something like room temperature or even above that, which is how QNX memory actually works. But that feature is really important if you start thinking about scalability. So if you, if you need a million dollar freezer in order to do something like chill down a quantum computing chip, that's fine as long as it's sitting in a room and everyone can connect to it from in that room, like in a cloud type infrastructure. But networking lives in the infrastructure around us. It needs to actually be every 25 or 50 kilometers in fiber hubs. You just can't scale it with exotic pieces like deep freezers and high vacuum. So the first thing that we started to think about was what is the value proposition of this instrument in the real world, which the value is that it could enable scaling because it doesn't require this sort of exotic support structure. Then when we started to think further about it, we thought the problem is that there's nothing to plug it into in today's world. So this is where the, the sort of invention of the hardware stack came, came out. We said if we want to actually literally have a drop-in solution for fiber, 
we need to think about how to make all of this laboratory stuff that doesn't like to operate at telecom talk to telecom. And that started a, an invention process where each one of the instruments in our suite, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how could this not only operate in the world, real world, but how could it actually be simplified in order to go into a box that sits in a server rack. And five years later, <laughs> we've, we've managed to, to, to deploy in two cities, but it took maybe four years to get to the point where we did a, a feature freeze in order to start manufacturing the instruments. We still had a sales pipeline last year of about $2 million that we fulfilled. And that's selling both the individual components of the rack and the rack systems themselves to test beds. Amazing. So well, to, a, a quick follow-up on that. So um, existing fiber, I, I think you said, yeah. and then I, yes, also curious about the distance that, that you're able to, to go is citywide metro distances or just across the street between buildings, or do you envision this could go long distance? So the Deutsche Telekom uh, publications that came out just a couple of months ago showed an 82-kilometer stretch in one of their papers and up to 100 kilometers in some of their more recent works. Uh, the original work that we had published in New York showed that we were doing something on our 34-kilometer network. But the real answer is it's hard to, to send single photons through fiber because you'll eventually lose them. So you only can go as far as the losses prevent you from, from going. I see. But it's very good for metropolitan scale distances. That's, that's quite easy. When you start trying to think about how do you go distances beyond that, like let's say that you want to connect uh, New York to Washington, D.C. Then you need repeaters, just like you do in the, the digital world. But the problem is that regular digital repeaters don't work in quantum. So then you have to invent a quantum repeater. And Connect's actually been working on that really steadily since the point we spun out. The quantum memory is the core of a quantum repeater. They work a lot more like relays, uh, where effectively uh, you're able to, to swap the properties of these entanglement uh, between particles along the way in order to get your message from one, one location to the next. And the, the important part about that is that you have to be able to control which ones are interacting at any given time, and that's where the memory comes in. So memories really give control to the network. But the other thing that memories do well is if you're in a data center and you would like to start switching between which computers you're talking to, almost like a router, the quantum memory becomes the router because it has to hold the entanglement and release it in order to interact with the next system. So the quantum memory is by far the most sophisticated device that we build. But the other devices uh, are very important for just being able to create the entanglement itself in a very reliable way and validate it at the endpoint. This is all just so amazing. And so I, I guess that what you were, were saying about using amplifiers along the way, that would be breaking the, observing the photons, right? Thus mm -hmm. breaking Correct. the entanglement. And so, so th that's why you need this kind of specialized. Uh, yeah, specialized equipment. repeater. Yeah. So everything everything <laughs> yeah. Quantum needs another quantum thing, right? So yeah. But it's exciting because when we started five years ago, uh, I think quantum repeaters were things that were mostly the theory that people published in academic papers. We've actually shown entanglement swapping, which is one of the underlying protocols over our network in New York. And we've been busy upgrading our quantum memory to be able to demonstrate repeater nodes sooner than later. So okay, great. stay tuned. One, one last question then, um, a business question, you know, what's next? on the business side then, now that the funding has been raised? The funding uh, was an important step for us because it really literally supports these use cases, which we've been thinking about for a while, but needed to have strategic partners to actually validate uh, the, the use cases themselves. So uh, we not only work with Cisco, which you know from the announcement, right? But we have also financial services, critical infrastructure and defense uh, colleagues, which we work with, uh, some of those announcements will be coming soon, but each one of them is to demonstrate use cases. I think that what we've learned watching these types of emergent techs come to market is that it's difficult because you're not only inventing the tech, but you're also inventing the market. 
And part of the invention of the market is to, is to really find the niche applications at the beginning that justify the, the scaling of your technology. So right now, I think it falls into two buckets. We've talked a lot today about the, the data center and larger sort of networked of quantum machines use case. But the other use case is security. And I think that's much more near term. And there's two ways to think about security and quantum networking. One is that you can literally encrypt the particles of light with your message. Uh, and th that's been around for a while. That's something that people uh, build keys with so that you can have keys to authenticate something like this meeting. But the way Connect looks at it is that the adoption curve will be bettered by finding ways to use quantum today to enhance the security of digital networks. So it's what we've been working on in, in two different ways. One of them is uh, basically eavesdropper detection, where you would lay a series of quantum on top of the digital network and use the quantum, which is very sensitive to being disturbed, to be able to actually be an eavesdrop, eavesdropper detector on the channel. And its sensitivity is far beyond anything you could do right now with classical. And the other one is to validate position. So if a, if a bank or an energy grid, if you want to know that you're actually addressing the entity in its location in space, you can actually verify that via quantum in a way which is much more powerful than what you can do with classical. And you can imagine the, the applications of both, right? One, one is basically keeping your line secure. The other one is making sure that you know who you're talking to. So those two security applications are a way of using quantum to enhance the digital, but doesn't actually carry the information itself because quantum bits are comparatively slow compared to the streaming speeds that we're enjoying right now. Um, so in order to, to ease the adoption at the beginning, you have to really show where it still has advantage. And I think those are two really great examples of how it can add a lot of value to existing digital infrastructure. Absolutely. Just tremendous potential here. Thank you, Noel, for sharing this with us. We'll, we'll keep watching and uh, keep up the hard work. Uh